connected and then you're not because it's Google and <laughs> of course you can't, you can't trust Google. You can't, you just can't trust Google. You just can't. So let me refresh here. And we're on. Woo. Hello, All everybody. Right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time you're watching this, because I don't know if you're watching it live or in zombie mode. Zombie mode, fortunately for you, is not that you're dead, it's that you're watching it non live. Yeah, makes sense. And so that stupid sure. joke. <laughs> First matter of the day, as you see, Mr. Sedarsky, we agreed, I'm going to pronounce it in the Russian way, That's and myself perfect. have a, we're wearing the mask. Why? See the microphone? Be ready. Okay. Wear your fucking mask. I, I I agree with the gentleman. Wear your fucking mask. Repeat it's, it. Wear your fucking mask. It's not it's, about you. No. Mask is not for you. This protects yeah. others from you. Yeah. So that's the point. Yeah. If you don't wear it, you can provoke a lot of deaths. You know, yeah. like the idiots in the in the Clinton, you know, in the in the Clinton, sorry, in the Trump uh, Town halls that you know that Stanford just said seventy thousand people were contagion and then a lot of people died because you know they just so don't do that yeah. don't be an idiot and yeah. more importantly these you can cause deaths and chronic illnesses really bad ones lungs and anything else so the last thing as I always say if you don't care about people's well being their health you think you're Superman immortal or even worse you don't care leave this fucking channel now. I don't want you here. I don't want potential murderers watching this channel. Sorry. All right, fine, I'll go. Fine, I'll go. <laughs> oh wait, no, no, not me, not me. Yeah, okay. no, not you. I, I so wear we my can, fucking mask. We can take it off. We can take yeah, it okay, off. Okay, all right. So after that fine, fine way and polite way, I have to say things as usual. Hello, Ship. How are you? I'm excellent. Uh, you know what? Considering take, the circumstances take, take, take of the, the world. Headphones off and take the mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. bothering you <laughs> all the time. There we go. You're better now. Yes, much better. How, how's things in your neck of the woods? How's things in your in the in the west of Canada? Uh, you know what? Pretty good. Uh, I was living in Toronto, and then we decided to move out west for the winter. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a calmer life here, mm -hmm. and I like it. And it's going to be. Let me know if it's going to be colder in the winter there than you, that is usually in the, in Toronto in the winter. Or is this not more of the same thing? Toronto is cold and snowy. Uh, where I am, Victoria is uh, is less so. Like temperatures rarely go below zero. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that was part of the reason for the move. Wait, wait, wait! You're talking. You're talking in centigrades. I know. I know. Oh my we're, god! We're we're, we're, we're a British colony. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> well, the British. Let's be honest. They don't. They they mix things. You know. Sometimes they go with sure. kilos. Sometimes we go. With Fahrenheit, sometimes you go to the centigrade. Sometimes they tell you to measure stones, and you're like, "What kidney stones? What the fuck are you talking about?" <laughs> I, yeah, I can't keep track of any of it. But um, yeah, yeah, here is a. We 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 thought about the idea of being in Toronto for the winter and doing social distancing outside, and that was going to be impossible. So we decided to move to a place where we could be outside. So uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm you, a proper West Coast guy now. Okay. That's that's a good thing, I guess. I think I don't know. I've been biking, <laughs> kayaking. You know, that's just kidding. Living the life. <laughs> so um, imagine my name has changed right now. From now on, I'm Dr. Victor Frankenstein. This is my syringe. I just popped it in you. You are free of the of the pandemic. We're oh, fine. Great. Pandemic is over. So, what's the thing that you've been missing for months? Like, I just want to do this. You haven't been able to, and you're dying to do. Casual sex with strangers, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> Where do I sign? For? No, I'm sorry. I'm not... <laughs> no, no, um... no, no, forget about it. I was joking. My wife can see this at any moment. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I miss uh, restaurants and bars. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's the big one. It's kind mm -hmm. of also why we left Toronto, because, like, to be in a big city and not being able to actually take advantage of being in a big city. It's like, why, why be there? Yeah. So that was the thing. My, my wife and I, we would go out, you know, pretty regularly to, to restaurants and bars and um, just can't do it. Can't do it. Yeah. That's... I can't imagine, I can't imagine in a town like New York, you know, for the people who's used to go out for dinner, you know, how, how's been in the last six months because 
most of the most of what makes New York New York is the is the dining outside, right? Yeah. 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 So you're still paying all the money to be in a big city, <laughs> but you can't actually enjoy going to the movies or uh yeah, out for dinner, drinks, dancing, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah. But I'm I'm getting too old for all of that anyway, so nah, you 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 don't get old, you get you are vintage. Oh you. <laughs> So, um, do you miss conventions at all? And I don't mean even the part of, you know, of course, you miss the interaction with the fans, but I mean the part of seeing your pals in the in the profession that you almost never see and then get together for dinner at a con and you just talk shop or anything else. Yeah, I mean, even just before the pandemic, I was having a lot of difficulties going to conventions because most of them were in America and being Canadian, I was having more and more difficulty crossing the yeah. border. Yeah. Like uh a lot more harassment and taken into the back room and stuff and super stressful uh, so I'd, I'd actually stopped kind of doing a lot of conventions now uh, yeah yeah it, it, it's unfor it's unfortunate but also i mean i i did find i love conventions uh i love meeting people and you know fellow creators and fans but uh but boy are they tiring Mm -hmm. like you know and you always justify you're like oh conventions only a couple of days but it, you know there's a day of preparation a day of travel you always get sick at the convention so when yep. you come back you got another couple of days um so strangely enough not having the conventions means uh i've been getting more work done on time yeah that's the, that's what well also i was going to ask do, do, have you find how you found by the end you know by the end of each day that you've overworked and i and i mean that you're doing more or about the beginning of for example of the pandemic did you did you notice that it was difficult for you to work to come to focus yeah i would say the first the first month of the pandemic was i was mostly focused on um family and friends uh convincing them to come back to canada for, for the first part because my parents were in the states a lot of my friends were in the states uh, and you can kind of see the writing on the wall, like borders were going to close. And I was like, you have to come home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, just, uh, it's, you know, this is myself and my wife in Toronto and, um, uh, you know, the focus was on what are we going to do and like kind of preparing and, um, constantly checking the news. <laughs> like, so it was super distracting, obviously. So I didn't get a lot of work done and also just thinking about the industry, like what was going to happen and, you know, it felt like every few days another uh, shoe dropped yeah. where, you know, oh, this thing I was working on isn't going to happen. Oh, this thing isn't going to happen. Oh, diamond isn't happening. Like, <laughs> it, was, it was a lot to process. So I'm just like, okay, well, what's my career going to be? Like, how am I going to make money too? So, because uh, also with sex criminals, because it's through image, um, we don't get paid for the work we do. Uh, until the shops pay Diamond and Diamond yep. pays Image. So it's yep. like three months after it comes out, I get paid for the work I've done. Um, and I had three issues that were out in the world that I hadn't been paid for, and then Diamond... Yeah, decided, <laughs> so, decided we are not going to pay people for for four months, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so so my concern was like, oh, like three full issues that I've drawn, I'm not going to get paid for, which I'm counting on. So there's a lot of trying to figure out financially what uh, what we were going to do. So, so writing was really hard because also when you sit down to write, you're writing a, usually in a world where none of this is happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, well, what do you, how do, how do I write? How do I pretend like the world's fine uh, and, and write, you know, a Spider-Man story or a Daredevil story? Yeah. Um, so that, that became tricky. Did, sure. did any of your Marvel books get post or get a, get a you know, hiatus? Um, all the things that weren't announced did. So uh, uh, Daredevil luckily kept going, but I had like maybe three, three or four books that uh, uh, I've been in talks with Marvel about, and, and those were all put on pause. Two of them, I think, have come back, mm -hmm. um, but, but not, not quite at 100%. Um, some of it's timing, like, you know, if I have a book pause that was supposed to tie into Empire or whatever, well, you know, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I was super fortunate in the sense that I'm a free agent right now. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 uh, I'm not exclusive to Marvel. So I was able to kind of also pick up work at other companies. Um, 
you know, I think it was a lot harder for people who are like either DC exclusive or Marvel exclusive or whatever exclusive um, because there was less ability to go outside the company to get, to get the gigs to keep food on the table. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Marvel, Marvel treated me quite well during the pandemic. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, they always kept, you know, my, my exclusive guys, they were always, yeah. um, almost at all times, they were also also fed, you know, it's, even if their books were paused, mm-hmm. the Ricky at CB and the others were always trying to get, you know, covers here and there, short story here. So, yeah. so they were really, so nothing, nothing against them. That, that, they, they did an amazing job on that. Um, yeah. And in terms of what you said, that was at the beginning, but then do you overwork, you know, since you're home? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I was also... Um, I, I was still drawing sex criminals uh, during all this time too, um, uh, and a Batman story for DC. So I found that was a bit easier. Um, uh, we actually we were supposed to start drawing because we did a Batman story for myself. We were supposed to. Oh, I'm having connection issues. Sorry. It's fine. It's fine. You you just. Yeah. Uh, just no problem. Fine. Um, we were supposed to start drawing the Batman story after I'd finished Sex Criminals, but once I realized that the Diamond situation might not resolve itself, uh, we bumped the Batman thing up, um, and that was a godsend mentally because mm-hmm. to sit down and just draw a thing much easier than writing during this period yeah. mm-hmm. because you you have the script, you can focus, you can you know it's it's one step after another. Uh, yeah, you can, whereas, you, can, you can isolate from the world, right? While you're while you're drawing. Yeah, exactly. So, so that was that was a real godsend being able to work on that Batman story. Once that was done, coming back into Sex Criminals, um, writing has gotten easier. Like once everything kind of became the new normal. Once it became like, oh yeah, no, I wear a mask out and I do this, and you know, I don't do this now, and okay, um, uh, figure out the way to work. Uh, yeah, right. Writing is. Yeah, maybe I'm maybe I'm working too much right now, but it doesn't feel like it because I finished drawing Sex Criminals, mm-hmm. which was which was like a full time job on top of the full time job of writing. So without having something to draw, it was much easier to write. <laughs> do you feel do you feel liberated because Sex Criminals is finally over? In a yeah, way? I mean it's 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 a lot of feelings. Like I I cry drawing the last page because it's a book that's been you know, seven years of my life, changed my life, yeah. like uh, drawing all these characters that mean so much to me. Um, so it was super sad finishing it, but also just like, it was a, definitely a wait because um, it's the most labor intensive thing that I do because I'm drawing it, coloring it, lettering it, designing it, adding jokes and things. So uh, it's, a lot, <laughs> it's a lot of work. My wife has um, forbid me to draw anything for at least six months. <laughs> and she's Which pro- fair. She's, I think she's probably right. She is. She is. It's funny because like afterwards I had a, a, a project um, with uh, uh, DC um, and we were trying to figure out an artist and I was like, oh, it'd be, it'd be cool if I drew this thing. And uh, I started to do the math. Like, could I do it? Like as a mini series, I could figure it out. And I, I casually mentioned it to my wife and she was like, there's no fucking way. No. So she brought the baseball, she's, she's right. the baseball bat into your face and said, I know how to use this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's and she's right. Like I've got like nine books or something like I'm writing. The idea of drawing a full series is stupid. Mm-hmm. Um I I've I've often said this in interviews that um artists have uh short term emotional memory. Like when they're working on a book, it's they're just like, oh, this is too much. This is too much. Like oh, these hours are crazy. I, I can't do this ever again. And then like three days after you finish, you get a new script. You're like, oh, that'll be fun. Like you forget the feeling of drawing a book and how much work it is. In a way, it's got to be like a, a drug withdrawal, right? You know, like yeah. you're drawing and then, oh, my God, I can't stand it anymore. And then three days later, you know, like the drug, you need you need to go back to the cigarette or something. And that your your brain is asking you to go in masochistic mode again. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And it, it forgets how hard it is mm-hmm. because it's every new issue, every new series is potential. 
it's like, oh, that'll look so cool. Oh, it'll feel so great. Mm -hmm. It hurts. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. As, a, as an artist, let's separate here, you know, the writer and the artist. As an artist, do you need, I know you said, you know, you just draw, you just drew a, a Batman story, but it's normally you're more geared to, I, what I want to do is my own personal stuff as, a, as, a, as an artist. And then as a writer, you tend to go more into, you know, into the superhero. What is, is there any in the different muscles you want to use there or is it just a coincidence? Um, it's, it's just kind of what's happened. Like, uh, I always kind of did my own thing. And then, uh, when Matt came to me with the idea for sex criminals, I'm like, Oh yeah, that'll be fun. We, we did it. Um, and it opened doors at Marvel and, uh, I, I just find it hard to turn that down. Mm -hmm. Like when they offer me like a Spider-Man book or a fantastic four title, like, I'm like, sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I not? Um, yeah, the trick is just figuring out time. Like I, I, I still do write creator own stuff. Or, or lift and uh, Captara and like I've got a few more coming out that I've been yes. working on over the pandemic. So um, yeah, I, th I think it's healthy. I will say, in a lot of ways, it's easier to do the Marvel work. Mm -hmm because the characters are established and you kind of know the voice in your head. Like I know what Spider-Man sounds like and I know yeah. what Reed Richards sounds like. Um, but when you create a new character, it's like, well, what do they sound like? What do they look like? What's, what's their motivation? Um, so, so that, I think it takes more, takes more work, but it's more satisfying mm -hmm. yeah. to, mm -hmm. to fully flesh it out. Well, when, when did you um, realize I mean, you start a new a new creator on like Steel Water, for example. Mm -hmm. This world, and you feel this world is now real, because I don't think it's the, it's the first issue or the second issue. You know, it's, it, it'll take a while for you to feel safe with that, right? Yeah, I mean, it's really it's when the art comes in. So with Steel Water, we did it with Skybound, mm -hmm. um, and Skybound likes to bank a lot of scripts and art, and so. Uh, I, I had written maybe three or four issues before we'd even talked about the artist mm -hmm. and they'd asked me for a fifth issue. And I was like, I can't, I can't write a fifth issue without seeing the characters. Yeah. Like I can't, I can't hold on to the world. I can't, uh, I can't keep track of things. Um, and so when Ramon came and started drawing the characters, then they came to life. The, the world came to life. I can visualize the town. I can, um, the 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 scripting changed for the characters as soon as I saw them, because R Ramon co-created them. Yeah. He co-created them five <laughs> issues in or whatever, but retroactively, I, I went back and I, I redid the dialogue to match the feeling that he gives the characters. Yeah. So the, really, once the art comes in, that's that's when you, that's when the world makes sense. That's what I was gonna say because if you are writing uh, isolated without the art. Hmm. That synergy that we love as comics creators doesn't doesn't happen. Which is, I always say that when there's good synergy, as you just said, Ramon Crow created even when he started an issue. Five, when you had already already done issues yeah. one to five, when it comes back, it becomes like a third entity. It's not yeah. you or it's not Ramon. It's yeah. the third entity that's the real creator, the storyteller. Yeah. So working in that isolation without seeing the art, it gets it's gotta be painful, right? It's super hard. Um, during this period too, I've been kind of tinkering with the novel, and uh, and it just feels weird because like there's never going to be any art associated with it. Like I have to kind of create the visuals through the text at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it is an, an artist changes the tone of a of a book so greatly. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you know, I even think of just kind of the Marvel work and juggling a lot of different artists and uh i can't help but imagine like oh what if this issue was drawn by this artist instead of that artist like like would it would it work better would it you know would it harm it would it make it scarier or more comedic uh um yeah it's it's that that's the trickiest part about working for a company like marvel is um sometimes that's out of your hands 
and you just don't know, you know, how yeah. it's going to work with this new artist. And maybe this project will fail. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's the artist's fault. Maybe it's just the combination. It's like um, you can be good uh, apart, but not work together. Absolutely, because uh, of course, as a, as an artist, you like the writer to write for you, not you know that just generic, but to be yeah. thinking this is what Chips likes to draw or he doesn't, or I'm going to challenge him here or there. You see, there's a relation there. So yeah. as a writer, I, I'm pretty sure it's the same for you. You want to write for that artist, right? So when yeah. you don't know the artist, it's like, okay, I need to go back when I see the art because I'm going to have, even if I, I want to change things to adapt to him, right? Yeah, sometimes uh, there was one instance where uh, I did a Spider-Man annual and uh, I'd, I'd written most of it without knowing who the artist was going to be. And then uh, it was ended up being Mike Allred. Mm -hmm who I love, I was like, oh, this is not a Mike Allred script at this point. So I had to add like kind of a fun killer robot. Like I had to make it a Mike Allred script after I'd already started writing it uh, uh, just to make sure I didn't bore him to death. Whereas mm -hmm. another artist would have like kind of uh, probably liked the, 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 the but you want to make sure that you, the artist that you end up having Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, is it frustrating when you have to come back, go back to a script because of what the artist do, does, or is for you it's it's the other way around? You you love it because it gives you more ideas than you were expecting. It's uh, um, it's it's <laughs> it can be both great and terrible, frustrating <laughs> and joyous. Um, like there, in some instances. Uh, it's 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 seamless. Like I worked with Chris Anka on Star Lord, and we did White Trees together. And he's so professional, and his layouts are just so perfect. And he knows exactly the space to leave for the the dialogue. He nails the uh, the expression so well. Um, not a lot changes in the dialogue because he's he's really drawn towards the script. Um, there will be sometimes just miscommunication where I'll I'll have to like rewrite the dialogue to have it work better um uh or or cut a lot of it or change the order of dialogue because like the one thing i always stress with the artists i work with is when they're doing their layouts rough in where they think the balloons are going to go yes. to see if it works because a lot of times it just doesn't i'm like oh my god now this character has to say a thing before this character or this character can't say the thing because mm -hmm. there's no room um Probably the, 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 the toughest rewrite I ever had to do was um, uh, the, uh, the best defense mini from a couple years ago, just before mm -hmm. Invaders. Uh, the, I did the Namor one shot with uh, Carlos. Yeah. And uh, uh, Carlos did an amazing job. Um, but uh, we were like three days before the printer deadline and the editor uh, wrote to me, Tom Rebort, and he said, this isn't working. I'm like, well, what do you mean it's not working? He's like, uh, I, I, I think uh, partly it's the, 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 the art is making the characters too serious, uh, but mostly like your writing isn't getting across that the main character is a hero. I don't think this plot works. We have to rewrite the whole thing. I'm like the whole thing. We had three days to the print deadline. The art's done. The coloring is done. And so I had to, to look at blank, like, like pages without lettering on it and rewrite uh, the whole thing and change character motivations and like change dialogue. And um, that was super stressful, but he was right. Like Tom's like, Tom's an editor who's been at Marvel for like 30 years and uh, he's got an amazing story instinct. And he was worried that if we didn't nail that issue, then people wouldn't come check out Invaders. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so he's absolutely correct. But that was, that was the most stressful kind of rewrite when the art came in. And how much did you learn from that one? Uh, a lot. That you can, that you can use in, in, in Nexus scripts, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, I learned a lot from that one because um, Sometimes I think one of my flaws as a writer is I, I kind of make characters uh, too much of uh, assholes <laughs> because I like those kind of characters and um, 
all my friends are kind of assholes. Like, 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 uh, you know, you know, this is the kind of people I like to hang out with, you know? Um, but, uh, you need to have more empathy with the character as a reader. And so, um, that, that taught me a pretty valuable lesson in, um, maybe tweaking my instincts a bit and not just writing for myself, you know, and writing for, for people who maybe can't see past characters being assholes. <laughs> <laughs> too much, uh, too, too much irony can be, can work to your own detriment, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. W uh, when you're, when you're working, being on, being on a script or in the art, do you need absolute silence or, or you go with music, podcasts, you know, TV shows that you've already watched in the back, so they don't disturb you. Or it depends on each on each part of the process. How is it working for you? Um, everything has different uh, steps. Um, if I'm uh, figuring out the plot, like 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 big story beats, um, uh, I tend to do it uh, with no music. Um, when I'm doing the dialogue and writing the script, I do it with like soundtracks, so things without lyrics. Uh, when I'm penciling, uh, I pencil lyrics and maybe listen to interviews. So mm -hmm. uh, every stage requires kind of less focus. And so I can kind of add more, uh, more dialogue words to the music. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm, I'm really good at working in, um, in clutter and chaos, like uh, before the pandemic, Uh, I would always work in coffee shops, mm -hmm. always, because my training was at a newspaper, and, and in the newsroom, like there's action happening everywhere, and you have to write to the deadline. Um, so uh, the the silence of the pandemic has actually been a little tricky for me. Sometimes I put on like just like ambient coffee shop sounds. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just, no, just like I'm, a, I'm not surprised at all. I always explain the same. I am the fifth of five guys. Five, five boys. Mm -hmm. So my home, as you can imagine, was always, always noisy, always chaos. So every time that I have, I need a cacophony around, any sound, because yeah. I always feel when there's no sound around that somebody's going to come in the back and it's going to stop me. <laughs> you're like, what's going on? There's no sound. You know, you feel, uh, yeah, like, yeah. You feel like, in, like you're in the middle of The Shining, you know? <laughs> and Jack. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so I, un I understand that. And it's the same for you in the, in the, with the art. I mean, layouts is silence because you're composing the page, pushing everything yeah. in, in the right spot. And then the more you do, um, as you said, with the coloring, it's just more, you, can, you can just go freer with, with the sounds around. Yeah, the more problem solving I have to do, the more I need kind of quieter, you know, less lyrics, things like that. Um, but, but yeah, when, once I hit the coloring stage, uh, It's very instinctual at that point, so I, I can, I can listen to things like that are like podcasts. I, I tend to not these days. I used to listen to tons of podcasts before I was a comic writer, but mm -hmm. now I find that all the times when I used to listen to podcasts were like when I was going for walks and things. But now when I go out and walks, I'm thinking about stories. Yeah. So I, I just never hear the podcasts. At, yeah. You know, so I it, end up tuning right. them out. Now, and did you adapt at all? I mean, imagine you are drawing a, a, a scene that is full of epics or writing it. And then you're like, okay, I need to have, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or Last of the Hoikans or Star Wars or something epic. So your yeah. brain is focused on that. And then, oh, this is a lot of a scene, emotional. So I yeah. have, I don't know, French classic music, romance music from the 19th century. You know what I mean? Do yeah. you adopt at all or it's like, yeah, I don't care? I, I, I mix it up a bit. I have a main writing playlist, which is, um, mostly like Max Richter, it's like a German composer, and yep. he did the, the music for The Leftovers, mm -hmm. which is like my favorite TV show, but it's very sad. Like I can't play it out loud and my wife gets angry. It's just very <laughs> depressing. It's just really sad. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I, I love having that kind of emotion when I'm uh, writing books. Um, but, but uh, you know, one of, one of the fun things about the fact that superheroes have permeated all pop culture when I go to write a, a character who's had like a TV show or a movie, I can put on the soundtrack of that TV show or movie. Like when I was, I, I wrote like a Batman thing and uh, I made a Batman playlist. All like the, the Tim Burton Batman stuff, the Hans Zimmer Batman stuff. <laughs> and like, 
it, it helps, you know? <laughs> if you're going to write like a character like Superman, put on the Superman theme. Like, like yeah. if you want to feel like a kid again, it's 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 perfect. Yeah, you have Captain America, so you're going to use that music from the movies, et yeah. cetera. Oh, the Avengers. Yeah. Okay, I got a soundtrack. The soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> hey, if we use it, we'll better, you know, they use our stuff, so. Yeah. Why not? It's fair, it's fair. You're right. What do you think, um, if you think there's any anything, I mean, uh, it's the most unique thing in the comics language as compared when we compare it to, to you know movies, literature, etc. Hmm, wow. And then I'll I mean, go with and then I'll go with my crazy Albert Einstein theory, but you go first. You know, it's uh, the thing that's unique to comics is the page turn. Um like no other no other medium really has that like it, it's it's control of the reader um to be surprised by turning the page you don't have that with novels because the novels just kind of you know they just they run on and on and on but um but the page turn is the one thing in comics where uh you can control the reader perfectly mm -hmm. time everyone watches a movie at the same amount of time mm -hmm. but with comics you don't but stay on the page forever and and you'll stay on the page longer if you have more panels and more detail and stuff like it like it's 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 a weird back and forth of control between the reader and the artist writer uh which i find fascinating yeah as, as a medium uh, that's what i was going to say my, my crazy theory sorry guys i'm going to repeat the, the one i always say um I think comics is the only art that can defy Einstein's theory of relativity. Mm. Well, because in comics, you guys, and then we will go to the to the reader participation, which is also fascinating because you're a constant manipulator. But we need the reader too. But it's what I mean is, in comics, you can control the time and space at every second. As mm. I just said, because of the shape of the panels, you can slow, go faster, go slower because of shape and size, but also you can say, and I always go with Watchmen as an example, issue one, Laurie is in the background in one panel. We do mm -hmm. we, we make nothing out of it. Issue five, we see she's in the foreground and you'll suddenly realize, wait, this is exactly the same moment yeah. that we saw in the first issue. Yeah. And you just realize it because you see that. So you can manipulate time and space, be 20 pages and we are going to stay in the same second. Or we're yeah. going to jump back and forth. And I think in any other art, it's not natural. It just no. feels jarring. Like a, what, whatever way they try to fake a, a, flash, a flashback in a movie, you realize it's flashback. So it's out of the it's out of the regular pace. Yeah. Because movies want you to go forward. As a novel, it just wants you to go forward. But comics, the art itself, the art form, doesn't call for you to go forward. It's telling you to can go in any direction. So the arrow yeah. of time, as I said. Which Einstein says is always goes forward. In comic, it really doesn't. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and w there are tips and tricks that artists can use to draw the eye, to control where you're going to go on a page. Um, which again, yeah, you can't really do with other medium um, in terms of storytelling, anyways. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I find it fascinating. I think I think you know. I think the 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 one thing that's harder for comics to do than movie and TV is uh, emotional resonance. Um, uh, because people more easily imprint when it's Chris Evans as Captain America and, and he's doing the acting for you. Mm -hmm. Like, he, you know, like his voice and his mannerisms are like delivering this uh, dialogue. Whereas we ask more of the reader mm -hmm. in a comic, like is you, you're bringing the voice to it as a, as a reader. And, and and it's harder to make that emotional connection, I think. Yeah, and that's especially because that, artists change a lot. Like so, the the depictions of the characters change mm -hmm. so radically. And that's also the part that is fascinating, as as I just said before. You are the big manipulator as a comic creator, as we said, time and space, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. And then we need the reader to get involved. Yeah. At any moment, as you said, the page turn. You can do whatever, but if the reader is not compelled to do to. To, to move to the next page, we're fucked. Yeah. 
So yeah. how important do you think is to get the reader as part of, as we said, writer, artist, become a third person, but the fourth would be the reader? Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's pretty what accurate. What is the most engaging as for you as a creator in terms of taking the reader to be interested in what you do? Be more formal in the way you approach it. You, you approach a script, a story says, you know, this is the formal, this is the way to do it. So the reader gets into Or the other side, which is, for me, I think is this, I, I believe is what I'm gonna, you're going to answer me, is the emotion. The emotion is what is going to draw the, the reader in. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, they're they're both kind of the same. Like, uh, you can you can create a comic with kind of form, formal means, um, and and have it be quite emotional as a result of that, because mm -hmm. you are setting them up um, with a rhythm. Like, I love grids. Like, I'm not quite Tom King with the grids, <laughs> but you know, we did Sex Criminals on an eight panel grid. Uh, a lot of people don't even notice it, but like, it's to keep a rhythm, right? Because the book is about time, so you kind of want to keep that rhythm. And we broke the grid when the characters broke up, and then brought the grid back when the characters you know, like. I don't think we've ever had a reader say, mm -hmm. um, "Oh, I like what you did with the grid," like. But but we, you hope that the 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 formalism. Um, uh, and the breaking of it creates an emotional response that they don't know why they're having the emotional response. Yeah, if that uh, makes any sense. No, no, absolutely. Because as a magician, you want people to never notice a trick. Yeah, yeah. The moment they notice a trick, it doesn't work because they see you yeah. coming. That's why I always say about uh, uh, when I talk to young creators, I always tell them, don't ever think you know more than the reader. Yeah. Because they've been here forever. They know every fucking trick in the book. Yeah. So if you go with the trick they've already seen 20 times, they're going to notice in one panel. And then the suspension of the belief goes to hell and they are going to throw the book away. Yeah, exactly. So uh, how risky it is for you to work in that way when you don't want them to notice, but you want to push the envelope, but just say, how do you realize this is where I have to stop? <laughs> Yeah, it's tricky. Like, it's a lot of just trying to distract the reader from what you're doing. Um, even even besides, like, you know, any kind of formalism. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm I'm doing in, especially the Marvel comics, are I'm retreading old ground. Mm -hmm. Like the the my first year of Daredevil was basically born again, and and I, I knew it going in, but. Uh, the trick is to distract the reader from that mm -hmm. um, by adding new elements, by pacing it differently, um, uh, by by playing to the artist's strengths, uh, so they hopefully don't just go, "Oh, this is just the same story." Like you have to add new interesting elements in the writing, yeah. um, and and uh, a variety of art to 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 distract them, so so it has some impact. Yeah, this, you know, it's, it's like the old saying, the old dash, that every story has already been told. It's just about yeah. the way you the, the way you tell it, and especially about the nuances, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and that and that's a huge thing, especially doing Marvel and DC books, because the characters have been around for so long. It's super hard to find things that haven't happened to the characters. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a new twist. Like I knew in Daredevil, Matt Murdock has gone to prison. But the character Daredevil needs to go to prison, uh, or maybe go to prison. So uh, I need to put him in a situation where he could potentially go to a prison and still have the reader invested, even though they'd known he's gone to prison before. So mm -hmm. what's the change? Yeah, you know, the change in in our story is that he's going as Daredevil, that he's being tried as a a, a criminal superhero instead of you know the Matt Murdock misunderstanding you know mm -hmm. um so so that's a big thing just trying to find new twists on the classic stories yeah I, uh, by the way uh, why did you decide you know between all the possibilities you have as uh, and you've and you've worked in a lot of, of different media so you know what i mean between 
being an animator, you know, animation, storyboarding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and why did you say, if you said it, uh, comics are, are my first love? This is what I want to do. What made you decide that? Aside of being a reader when you were, were a kid, blah blah blah, and all that. Yeah, it, it's funny because I kind of like went away and came back. Like as a kid, I loved comics and I drew comics and I wanted to be a comic artist. And when I went to art school, all my teachers were like, "No, you don't do comics. We don't do comics." You know, that's, that's for children or whatever. Um, so they uh, they kind of they kind of you know they beat it out of us over three or four years. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I graduated from a program with 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 uh, a lot of comic artists who just tried to become illustrators, like magazine, newspaper is kind of like the high level mark. You know, get in the New York Times and you know you're you're an illustrator and something to be proud of. Um, so it took me a little while after that to kind of like fall in love with comics again, start doing them on my own. And the same for a lot of like people that went to that school, like Ramon Perez yeah. was in Sheridan as well. Uh, Kagan McLeod, who I did Captara with mm -hmm. Jeff Lemire yeah. was at Sheridan for a bit. Um, now they, of course, they love comics <laughs> because we've done well enough that, you know, we can help sell the program. But, uh, but it took me a while to because I have done some animation, uh, animation and portraits and all sorts of different kind of art jobs. Um, for comics, it's control. Mm -hmm. Like I have the most control there. Um, I know a lot of comic writers have kind of, you know, they dabble with screenwriting, but uh, I just, I, I, that's not my thing. Like, you know, I've been in pitch meetings where I'm like, helping someone pitch a movie and they're like, Oh, are you going to write the movie to me? I'm like, no, I wouldn't want to write a movie <laughs> because <laughs> <Isn't that crazy? laughs> it's totally out of your control at that point. Like it can be rewritten. The actors could deliver the worst performances. The director can change things. The editor can change things. The music can be bad. Like there's so many levels where it can fail and it no longer is uh, pure art. Um, that, uh, is why I love comics. Mm -hmm. Like, like things can go wrong. Obviously, if you have like two or three people on the team, like maybe the the artist has a different vision than you, or the colorist, or whatever. Um, but the the chances of it working uh, and being the thing that you want people to read are much higher than uh, with uh, a animation or TV or film. Yeah, I find anyways. Yeah, I remember. I don't know if you know this story, but I remember when I watched uh, Prometheus, uh, you know, the really Scott movie, and I was mm -hmm. like, this doesn't fit at all, you know, and I was like, yeah. how could Damon Lindelof did, do such a bad script and all that? And yeah. somebody, I I won't say who, but when we're off, off life, yeah, yeah. I will tell you, uh, he told me, uh, movies are a director's media. Don't blame the writer for this. So then I, I dug a lot, and then I, I realized that there was, I don't know if you know the story, but literally there was two, two scripts. <laughs> and then Ridley Scott okay. decided, I'm going to use the parts of each script that I like without caring if they if they fit between each other. You know, so you have, yeah. in one thing, they are the clever, the most, the smartest guy in the universe. Five seconds later, they are all stupid. Yeah. And doing the most yeah. stupid thing. And so it was just because the director decided, I don't care if it, you know, if it's cohesive, I just care if, if I like the visuals. Yeah. And that would just be heartbreaking to me as a writer, <laughs> like to go into a movie theater and sit down and then watch this movie and be like, what? Like, that's not what I wrote, but my name's on the credit. Like it's, yeah. 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 That, that's also, that's also the part that, that is going to be more warming about comics in a way is you play all the roles, you know, yeah. you are, Director, director of photography. You're the writer. You're the so you and your as this, as we said, the third entity you create. You are like the whole team in the movie, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and uh, um, we all start the same way. We all start with like that blank page. Like there's some, there's something about that as well. Like you know, uh, obviously you know in comics and you know there's there's budgets in comics, um, but. Uh, but it's not the same as like, oh, here's a, your million dollar movie and here's your $200 million movie. Like, uh, 
uh, yeah, we all we all start with the same blank page in comics. Yeah, I, and uh, and, you create, uh, and in a way you create the budget, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. because you decide how big is going to be. Mm -hmm. There's no limitation of okay, if you build that set, it's going to cost you five hundred grand. Yeah. You just do it. So that gives you a, a level of uh, of freedom that you could never have. Yeah. Because so, yeah. somebody can't call you and say, "Hey, you can't do that." Why? Because that's too costly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just a matter of time. Like when I remember yeah. when I was drawing the Batman story, there's some panels where I'm just like, "Oh, maybe these buildings are getting too detailed or whatever." I'm like, "Ah, what's another half hour?" Yeah. Just to, to make it fully realized the way I want it, the way I want it lit, the way I want it, the architecture to look. As an, uh, as an artist and, and writer, or writer, depend on on the brain muscles we're using here for this for this answer. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that giving the detail, sorry, giving the reader too much too much detail is overkill? That we always, I always say that comics are, as I said, Einstein and the second part is they're built in in pattern recognition. Yeah. You know, it's like 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 with the caves there's about that's rustling maybe there's an animal is going to kill me run we don't need yeah. to see it we just know it's there and this is still with us today so yeah. it's the same for you like in comics that never overkill let the reader complete it so as we said before he still wanted to read my story i, I missed a part of that is it the detail no, as I said, is uh, if you give them the reader too much detail, if you mm -hmm. overkill it, do you think we can lose the reader? That we need to give them some space to complete, you know, suggest and let them find the answer. Um, in in terms of art, like my art style is very simple, um, mm -hmm. and that's that's part of it. Like the fact that I. Uh, I'd like to be able to sum up an emotion or an image or a character in as few lines as possible. Yeah. Just to like, it makes it more iconic with the reader. Like you're able to kind of visualize that character from panel to panel easier. Um, I, I don't mind extra detail in comics. The only time it bothers me is when it's being used as a, um, uh, as a crutch because yeah. the storytelling isn't there. Yes. Like that's that's when it, it I, I, I get a little upset. Like sometimes a page will come in and I'll be like, why did you draw every brick on that building when um, uh, the characters are lost in front of it and you haven't, like the angle doesn't work. Like all these other things don't work, but they, they spent all the time drawing all the bricks. Yeah. Um, uh, readers love detail and, and depending on the artist, I love detail. Uh, like, you know, I worked with Jim Chung from Marvel 2-in-1. Yeah. Lots of detail, but he also knows how to balance it out. Like, he knows when to leave a space blank, and he knows when to add the detail, like, yeah. in terms of composition and storytelling, so it doesn't doesn't slow the reader down 100%. Yeah. Um, uh, so it, it, it can work really well. Um, it's, it generally isn't my personal style, but... Uh, but uh, I can definitely appreciate it when it's done super well. Yeah, that's just, but that's why I always talk, you know, uh, give uh, Brian Hitch as an example. Yeah. He's super detailed, but you can follow everything perfectly. So mm -hmm. that, I don't, I don't mind. I love it when it's detailed, but it's that way. Yeah. But yeah. when it's, as you said, I can't follow the story. It's just detail after detail, so I don't realize this makes no fucking sense. <laughs> and, and, you know, I've... I've, I've... I've made that mistake too. Like back when I was doing my own comics, I did a, a, like an all ages comic called Monster Cops. Mm -hmm. And it was still a simple line style, but I rendered it black and white, like gray tones. Like every little light had a little shine to it. Like I, you know, I molded all the faces, you know, with my brush. And um, I was posting it on like a message board back in the day. And I forget which one of the brothers, the twins, Fabio or Gabrielle, commented on it. Mm -hmm. But they're like, well, your line work is really nice. Why are you ruining it with like all the rendering? Mm -hmm. And they were completely correct. And I was doing it because I, I wasn't confident enough in the line work. Yeah. Like, like when you took the gray away and you just saw the line work is like, Oh, okay. It's not quite working compositionally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that, yeah. that was, that was the best comment I could have received. Cause like I, I changed my style almost immediately after that. And I made sure that the black and white was as, clear as possible 
and but, didn't need the gray tone. Yeah, but that's also part of being an artist for you guys. You've always horror vacui is always going to be there, right? That yeah. fear of not working enough or not letting everything as detail as it needs for the reader. Yeah, that yeah. Uh, even even when you're a seasoned pro, I I guess it gets better, of course. But it's always going to be there, right? That fear is always going to be there. Yeah, I mean, our art is abandoned. It's not finished. That's, that's, and that's completely true. Like no comic artist looks at a page and goes, yes, that is exactly what I want. It's perfect. It's time to move to page two. Yeah. Like there's just not that. You just get it to a stage where you're just like, you're not embarrassed by it. Maybe there's stuff on it you like and you move on to the next page because you know, it's still an industry that demands a high output. Yeah. Uh, Carlos Pacheco, remember what he used to say when he was asked by kids, when did he feel, you know, about a page that's delivered? And he said, look, the only way to, to stay in this job for as many years as I've had is page delivered, page forgotten. You just have, yeah. to, have to move on. Because if yeah. you don't move on from the page you have delivered, you are not gonna. You're gonna la not gonna last a year in this business. You just have yeah. to move. On. Yeah, and you you learn from your mistakes too. Like if there's something on the page that wasn't done as well as you'd hope, like you have that in your head for the next time. If that staircase. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, how many times have you had to tell to to an artist in the script or or afterwards, less is more. Don't give it that. I we don't need that much. You know, just suggest it for for the reader to to complete it. Is that has that happened to you at all? No, not really. Like I said, it, it, the heartbreaking ones are when the pages come in, uh, and I haven't seen the layouts, and oh. it doesn't work, and they put in too much detail, and I'm just like, well, you got to redraw it, and that's uh, very unfortunate. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, uh, I always feel bad about that. Like I always insist on seeing layouts yeah. from pencilers, yeah. unless they're seasoned professionals like uh, Butch Geis on Invaders. You don't really need to see uh, layouts from him because mm -hmm. he's been doing it for so long and he's just so good. Like it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, the newer artists, for sure, um, and usually it's usually the detailed artists as well mm -hmm. um, who. Uh, can, can, things can go wrong during the layout stage and mm -hmm. you just want to be able to help. Absolutely. No, no, we, in our case, we always send layouts because, you mm -hmm. know, safety net. That, that's yeah. Thing. And also things can get lost in translation too. So Absolutely. you want to make sure mm -hmm. that, you know, Absolutely. sometimes yeah. it's sometimes it's my fault because my script didn't get specific enough. So, yeah. No, that was that time was Anthony. He didn't say he didn't say he wanted the armpit hair. <laughs> the armpit hair, yeah, yeah, yeah. Always put the armpit hair in the script. <laughs> so, um, when you when you color, this is going to sound weird, but uh, yeah. when you color, do you ever think of the colors as sounds? And I'm not talking about synesthesia. I'm not suggesting you have an illness or anything like that. But you know, you're thinking uh, that I need loud, so I'm going to transmit to the reader that's loud or that's quiet. Um, less about sound, more about emotion. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely want to convey the feeling in a scene. Um, so I don't, I don't, I really don't really think of it in terms of sound, but I, I do think of it in terms of like. Um, Sometimes I'll change, like the only times I really change things in scripts um, on sex criminals anyways, uh, is usually time of day. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I'll change it. So like the time of day is like dusk mm -hmm. because I, I want a certain feeling that only, you know, the last bit of sunlight will give you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so yeah, it's more about emotion than sound, I think. Mm -hmm. And is there a way for you to as when you let me rephrase when you're writing is there mm -hmm. any time when you feel you need to draw what you mean to the artist or you um, you try to stay away from that when i the first time i actually wrote for an artist was howard the duck yeah. with joe canonis and i had to fight my instinct to sketch and show him um because uh it was how I was thinking and um, I was never disappointed with the word that came back, but it would be different than what I would do. And so my brain would get messed up like what, but that's different. 
most of the times it was better. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other, you know, mind fuck. But um, uh, so, sometimes if, if they're not getting it, I'll do a sketch. Um, you know, there, there, there've been a few instances. Again, it's usually the newer artists like um, that maybe have trouble with um, character perspective. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll show how the angle would look, uh, how characters would look at a certain angle. Um, I'll, I'll do that with quick sketches. Sometimes it's a caution design and I'll do a quick little sketch to get a thing across. Um, that's, that's mostly it. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll send photos of my face. Like if it's an expression, like, and yeah. they, they're not getting it, it'll be like, oh, more like this. And I'll take a picture like, and, and, uh, and that helps. But yeah, you don't want to, you want to let the artist have plenty of space to bring what they can bring to a project. So you don't want to overload them with all your specific demands. Sure. Um, and uh, I, I, I usually ask before um, I doodle the thing for them. I'm, mm -hmm. Just so I'm not stepping on toes, I mean, yep. it would be okay if I like sketched out what I'm thinking, and then I send it, and it's usually fine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I remember, like back in the day, like in this day, 2001, oh, hey, yeah. um, when uh, Chiarello, Mac Chiarello, used before the Internet Times, he used to bring uh, like a big, big book like this, thick, with uh, faces, expressions, just to show the new artists, you know, what wasn't working. So and so they didn't feel offended, you know, with him drawing in front of them. But like, mm -hmm. see what you're trying to portray this is this. And he would yeah. do the face and show the book at all times, which helped immensely the new yeah. artists because they got exactly what yeah. he meant. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. Mm -hmm. Um there there have been a couple of times like on Daredevil, like usually when we're close to deadline and explaining no longer works. Uh I've I've gone in and I've 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 colored things. Mm -hmm. Like like if somebody's hair or face or whatever isn't right and we run out of time, I'm like, okay, I'll, I got it. I'll go in and I'll change it. Mm -hmm. um, there was one page where I did the lettering on the page. It was like a uh, it was an issue that Lalit drew of Daredevil, and it was like the final page was like a splash page of Matt Murdock listening to all the voices in the city, mm -hmm. and I had such a specific idea for that. Like I lettered all that. Um, which you know you, you feel bad at the time because uh, it's somebody's job, but also it's like it's so specific. Like, do I want to put that person through the hassle of having to go back and forth with me on this, or can I just do it and just? Yeah, it could be worse, operate. right? If you don't specify and say that at the beginning, and then they come back with something that is the opposite of what you want, you are going to tell them to correct it. So it's much yeah. better to be proactive and say, "Look, I'm very specific about that. Let's work it out, right?" Yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely feel bad about it when I do things like that. Um, uh, but also it's like, it's such a high turnover industry. Like, yeah, you know, I'm taking a thing off their plate so they can move on to the next thing mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. So hopefully that's how it comes across. And the other way around as an artist, how many times do you have to control yourself from changing things on a script? I'm, I'm so nervous about, um, changing things. Like when we started working on sex criminals, uh, if something wasn't working and like I needed to change, like even like the angle that he was asking for, I would stress about it. I'd be like, how am I going to tell him this? Wow. And you know, I, I, you know, compose the email, send it and be like, yeah, sure. And, and, and Matt, Matt, a lot of times when Matt writes a script and sends it off, like he forgets about it immediately. So I could change like full pages and he wouldn't know, but I, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't feel like I can <laughs> actually do that. Um, yeah. There are, there are things in there where he, he thinks like, he thinks they're things that I came up with that he came up with and the thing that he came up with that I came up with. Like it gets really blurry at some point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like, but I, I always run it by him. If I have a suggestion, mm -hmm. like I, I added a page a couple issues ago cause I thought it was a nice beat and he's like, yeah, sure. I mean, like you know, we're getting paid the same amount no matter what. So if you want to do <laughs> extra work, go for it. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's go with the people's questions. If you're yeah, okay sure. with that, yeah. Let me see. Uh, Blake Rival, hello. Is your name Charles? And you go by Chip? Also, <laughs> no, no, it's not. Anyway, also, what comic book influenced you the most? Um, Tell me, Charles. So, so uh, it's all fake. My real name is Steve Murray. Uh, I, I picked the name Chip 
because of Charles Schultz. Mm-hmm. Um, cause his nickname was all Sparky and I like the idea of a, a child's nickname for a grown man. So I chose Chip because Chip goes with Charles and then I stole the last name Zdarsky from a friend's ex-girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And what was the second part of that question? Uh, also <laughs> he makes both very different things. Also what comic book influenced you the most? Um, I don't know. They, I, you go through so many different stages in life as a reader that every stage it feels like there's a new important book that influences you. Uh, I think the core one is going to be Justice League International, mm-hmm. Giffen and Dematias and Kevin McGuire. Yeah, that's that's the one. That's like that's the gold standard of comics. I think. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, I completely agree. We we are not, in, I think, in the majority, but that book changed. The way I build comics in a in a in a yeah. big way when it's, I didn't know you could do that with superheroes. So yeah. like, whoa, wait, you can do this? This is fun. And it and, and then not only was it fun, but it also like when it got serious, it got really serious. Absolutely. Like like it was able to play both sides of it. And that's the thing that I, I really took away from it as a writer. It was like if you want if you want your dark, serious moments to have impact, you need to surround it with something that's lighter. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, to have to both sides of the coins to get you the balance, right? So let me see. Kagan Ray says his name is Steve. Yes, yeah. Javier Merino. Hi, Blake Rival. You have a great sense of humor. What's the most funny comic book you've read? I guess Justice League International or not? Oh, uh, all of Kate Beaton's books are probably the funniest. Like Hark a Vagrant is like I think number one in terms of like the Mount Rushmore of like funny comics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what about John Byrne Sea Hulk? Um, even even at the time, I, I think I, I I picked up the first three or four issues, and there was some fun stuff in there. Like I like the fourth wall breaking of it, mm-hmm. um, but uh, they they never struck me as as say as funny as like Justice League International. Yeah. That always felt to me like Burn reacting to Justice League in a way. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they okay. are funny. I can do it too. So yeah. it, it seems more a reaction than a, than a real, you know. So it worked yeah. in times, but not as a whole. Anyway, yeah. the Mercader, how did you uh, start writing Daredevil? It's a pretty different tone from the rest of your work, and, you've na- and you're nailing it. Oh, cool. Thanks. Um... Yeah, it's funny when uh, when CB Sabolsky came on board as editor in chief. One of the first things he did was he sent all the contracted writers uh, emails, basically saying, "What are your dream books? Like, if, if 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 you know the sky's the limit at Marvel, give me a list of what your dream books are." Uh, which was, I think, a super smart move. So he always he understands where the different writers want to go, um, uh, and and uh, and who to consider when things open up. So when uh, when Charles was going to leave Daredevil, he contacted me about about that, um, and uh, you know I'm immensely grateful to him. I think at that point I had kind of shown that I could do funny, but also maybe some serious stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but with Daredevil, it's a book you can kind of take chances on with creators uh, because we've seen a few different types of tones over the years. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. If CB kind of knew when he offered it to me where I was going to go with it. I was going to go kind of lighter, like Mark Wade, or darker, like you know Bendis, um, and uh, and yeah, I'm eternally grateful that he took that chance on me. Mm-hmm. And uh, and pitching that book at the Marvel retreat was like, like maybe my the most stressful moment <laughs> of my <laughs> professional career because you're you're pitching Daredevil in a room where. Uh, Charles Soule's there, Mark Wade's there, Joe Casada's there, like all these people who have had an impact on Daredevil. And I had to pitch like my version uh, and answer all the questions. And uh, I'm, I'm glad it's worked out. It's been a dream book. Like, yeah, it, it, it was my number one choice because of the fact that you can kind of do what you want with it. Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't touch a lot of areas in the Marvel universe yeah. kind of left to his, his own. Um, so you can kind of have like a darker, maybe more adult kind of version of it. Whereas you couldn't with Spider-Man or fantastic four, you know? Uh, yeah. I've, I've loved working on that. And he's part of the legacy of their label, right? 
And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. and I know, I know, CB thinks the same thing. You know, if mm -hmm. if you're going to let an, a creator do his thing, it's their devil, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's that's there's a lot of pressure there as a result of that too. Like writing spectacular Spider-Man, like there are a lot of creators that have written Spider-Man over the years, but it doesn't have the same like definitive mm -hmm. runs that, that that something like Daredevil has and as teams as well, which is also rare in comics. Yeah. Absolutely. Like when you think of each of those writers, you think of the those specific artists as well. Mm -hmm. Um which you don't get as much with say Dan Slott Spider-Man because there were so many artists over that period. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Jedi Garcia Celades says, Chip, thanks for all your work. I'm loving Daredevil and Sex Criminal and Spider-Man Life Story is my favorite comic of the year. Which oh, Marvel sorry. superhero would you like to tackle next? Uh, like, like he's going to tell you. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there is that. Um, yeah, I, I, I almost never say because uh, for the most part, someone's usually working on the book at the time and it feels a little weird to be like, hey, I'm coming for your book, man. Um, <laughs> Uh, I will say, like, I, I, you know, in terms of like bucket lists, like I've managed to check off kind of the big ones that I wanted to do, which is a lot of fun. Like Spider-Man, like that's my childhood dream and having the chance to write him in a couple of series has been great. Daredevil's my number one pick. Um, which is fantastic. Um, and same with Marvel two and one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, like if, if Marvel told me to go away tomorrow, I'd be like, okay, all right. I've, I've had a good run. Like I'd love to do more for them, but, um, you know, I've scratched all the itches, which is great. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you ever have any interesting writing in Superman? Um, yeah, I mean, I, the, the funny thing is like, I don't have a, I don't really have a list of like ideas for characters. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, it's always like if I'm approached about a book, I go away and I think about it. And if I have a good idea, then I come back and I go, yes, I'll do it. Um, I was approached to write some Flash stuff. I think it was backups for Josh's run mm -hmm. back when he started. And The Flash is my favorite character. I love The Flash. Like I read that book religiously when I was younger. Uh, but I... I Put aside some time and I thought about it and I was writing down story ideas. And I'm just like, no, these aren't any good. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing there. I can't, I, I haven't cracked it yet. And so I, I, I politely turned it down. Mm -hmm. um, so Superman is a character I love. I haven't given any thought to what I would do. Um, but if they came to me, I would, I would do what I do with every title where I'd just set aside a week and I would just think about it and I'd write down everything I could and see what worked. Yeah, like but, that's the other thing. You don't want to. You don't want to half-ass it. Like people are buying these books, they're spending money on them. Yeah. Um, a lot of people look at these titles as like, well, career goals. Like this is a good step in my career to say yes to this project. I'm like, sure, but if you don't have a good story, you're going to do yourself more harm, and you're going to do the readers a disservice. Absolutely. So I always want to make sure that I have a good story. Like I've, I've turned down a lot of books that I'm sure people would think I'm crazy for doing it, but mm -hmm. if if the story's not there yet. Like, it's not worth it. Yeah, I was asking because uh, most of the comics people I talk to tell me that Superman is the most difficult character to write because of yeah, how I, I can... he is, the limits you have here and there. So that's what yeah. I, I tend to ask. Would you would you like to do it? And some people are like, I don't know how I would be able to tell my own story with that character, considering you know the constraints. Yeah, I can I can I can see and understand that. I think. I think a character like Superman works really well as a contrast to other characters. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a, a lot of cases like Captain America is kind of a similar thing. Yeah. Like um, they're, they're good people, you know, uh, with strong moral vision. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the fun part is putting them up against somebody who maybe doesn't have that. Yeah. So I, I think, I think that's the key to those characters is making sure that they have a, a foil, somebody that uh, doesn't see the world the same way they do. Yeah, with Superman, it's, it's always about the moral compass, right? Yeah. Yeah, which is why people always go back to Superman, Batman stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, you know, they're both good men, but, they're, you know, Batman doesn't necessarily play by the rules the way Superman does, so you have that contrast. Mm -hmm. uh, La Guarida del Trepamuros, which is a, a 
the Spider-Man cape in English. Hi, Chip. I love your work in Marvel Comics and I have a question for you. Which is the most important power Spider-Man has? Power? Yeah. Oh. I mean, Spider-Sense is the thing that kind of differentiates him from other characters. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes him unbeatable. Like uh, one of my favorite issues as a kid was the Amazing Spider-Man issue where he fights Fire Lord, mm -hmm. you know, the Herald of Galactus. Yes, and it's 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 just him running, like Spider-Man just running from him and trying to stop him. And you know, the final scene is him just like finally having it out with him, and just like can't lay a beat on him. Like Fire Lord just can't hit him because he's just like he's able to dodge it all. There was an issue of Secret Wars when I was a kid it was the same. It was Spider-Man versus the X-Men. Everyone's like, how do you? How do you land something on this guy? Um, so that's fun. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's, it's fun as a writer to kind of try and figure out workarounds around it. Uh, uh, workarounds around this, the spider sense, you mean? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, like yeah. If, if the guy... That's got to be a lot of fun. Yeah. As, yeah. As you just mentioned, you know, it's like how, if I know he's unbeatable because of the, the spider sense, how do I make him beatable anyway? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Javier Menio says, I love your artwork and your scripts too. Uh, Robotman says, hi, Mr. Sedarsky, as we said in Russian. Greetings from El Salvador. I have a question. What books do you recommend? Sorry. Do you recommend me to improve your knowledge about writing? Fiction books, essays, historical? Oh, sorry, say it again. It broke up. Don't worry. Hi, Mr. Sedarsky. Greetings from El Salvador. I have a question. What books do you recommend me to improve my no knowledge about writing fiction books essays historical um i, I guess he means uh, books to improve as a writer the the the, the one that uh, i love is stephen king's on writing and i'm not a big stephen king guy like i, I don't uh, i don't tend to read a lot of horror but um but it was suggested to me a few years ago by friends and uh, I picked it up and it's, it's an amazing book because it's very yeah. straightforward on, on what a writer's life is like and uh, in, in his estimation, how to write well uh, and, and inspiring in the sense that like he sits down and he does the job. Mm -hmm. Like, because that's the big thing, right? Sitting down and actually doing the writing. Yeah. Um, the, the thing I usually say to most people, especially when it comes to like comic writing, is to read more than comics. Please. Fiction, nonfiction, like, like especially if you're like, like if you're thinking of writing a book about, um, I don't know, like the mafia or whatever. Well, you're gonna have to start learning about the mafia. <laughs> like, not just watch, not just watch Sopranos. Like, you're gonna yeah. have to like read some books on on the topic. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I read as much as I can, um, and it tends to not be comics as a result, because yeah. you, you can see with certain writers where their comics read like comics written by someone who only reads comics, like where a, a normal non-comics reader can't wouldn't be able to make sense of it. Because yeah. they're they're wrapped up in their own language. Yeah, that's the same when uh, I see trees. Or st I always say the same example. When I see a tree that looks like a comic book, yeah. I always say, "Look at the fucking window." Yeah. Yes, yeah. an artist. Life is what you, you're trying to abstract life into a two D page to make yeah. it three D. If you don't understand how it works, that leaf moving or falling from a tree in real yeah. life, it's just not going to work on a page. That's the same as you said. If you only read comics, that's too limiting. You have to understand everything else. Yeah, exactly. And I love, I also love the Stephen King, same thing. Joshua Dysart recommended the In Writing by Stephen King to me too. Yeah. And I was just reading it like, I went back with the, the phrase that oh, I've always been told by good editors over the years, which is, us editors love people who finish things. It's like, okay, that summarizes it perfectly well yeah, for, the new, yeah. for the new guys. Yeah. Uh, Pedro de Mercader tells you, how did you uh, create the meta scene from issue 14 of uh, Six Criminals? It blew okay. my mind. Yeah, so that was that was interesting because it, it was almost too real. <laughs> so so in, in the issue, like it's 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 basically these these two characters have to have it out. 
And Matt was really struggling with the script, like getting to that point. And I had a lot of discussions with him. I'm just like, like these characters have to have flaws. Um, they can't be perfect. He just didn't want to pitch the characters against each other, but I'm like, but they have to, because the story needs it. Um, so we had a lot of discussion about it. And then he just turned around and he just wrote this scene where it's basically us discussing that scene. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened after that? Like he, he sent the script to me. It's the only time I've rewritten his words um, because I'm talking in it. So I went in and I changed my dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, I got rid of a few things that would have gotten me fired from Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt doesn't seem to care about burning bridges, but uh, at the point I was still just starting out at Marvel. So I'm like, well, maybe let's get rid of this dialogue. Um, yeah, and then, you know, those scenes are best used kind of few and far between. Like, you know, it's the only real instance of us having a, a conversation in the book. Like, we show up kind of in backgrounds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but you don't want it to get too meta or else it takes away from the story. Absolutely. Uh, Pedro Mercader also asked, any tips for comedic, writing comedic, uh, comedic content? I mean, uh, no, that's, that's, that's probably the hardest thing, right? Like... Um, you know, we talked earlier about the page turn. That's, yeah. that's a huge thing. Like page turns work effectively for surprise and surprise uh, lends itself well to horror and comedy. Think about the page turns in terms of getting yourself a prop deal for the punchline of something. Yeah. Because that's the other downside with comics is that when you open up the comic, like you're your eye, if it's a visual joke, your eye will go to the punchline right away, um, which will ruin it for you unless you put it on the next page. Mm -hmm. And it's also the part about, I always repeat, when you th if you think as a writer that it's easy to make a joke, I always remind them, check anatomy books and see how many muscles do you need to move to be sad and how many muscles do you, you need to move for people to smile. And yep. you realize what's the easy part and what's the difficult part. Yeah, yeah. I, I also find like if I'm writing a script, it's like a comedy script. Um, those are the ones that I do more passes on. Like I go back and re-edit and re-edit and re-edit because um, uh, tightening jokes, making them work well, um, I, I find that takes a lot more edits. Yeah. Just to make sure they land well. But it's also about, you know, like talking about actors, you know, comedic actors that suddenly do, you know, like uh, Adam Drama. Sandler, Adam Sandler this year, you know, with uh, shit, I just blanked on the name of the movie. But, you yeah, know, Uncut like, Gems, yeah. Hey, thank you, Uncut Gems. And suddenly people are like, oh my God, he's such an amazing actor. And I'm like, wait, for him, this is easier. Yeah. Comedy yeah. is a lot more difficult. So when they don't nominate, you know, comedic actors for Oscars ever, because, oh, it's just a comedy. And like, no, it's, more, it's a lot more difficult to do that. Yeah. When they yeah, do yeah. drama, for them, drama is like this. Yeah, yeah, Tom Hanks is the prime example of that. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. He, he was the master of comedy, then suddenly like, pop, like, no, oh, this is easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kagan Ray, do you think you lettering Spidey 310 would have made a tangible difference? Oh, if I lettered it? Yeah. Uh, it would have been worse. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm, I'm confident enough with art and coloring, um, but I'm, I'm not very confident with the lettering. Like mm -hmm. uh, I letter sex criminals, um, and that was kind of mostly out of necessity just to, yeah. uh, have kind of full control. But, uh, the, the professional letterers at Marvel hires are, uh, much, much better than I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> much better <laughs> at, 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 at being able to, uh, um, not crowd a page and uh like i've got my handwriting font and you know yeah. it's good at a certain size but if i shrink it too much it like gets a mess whereas like professional letterers know how to do it okay yeah. felipe gonzalez hernandez says many thanks for your work i think that all your titles have a perfect balance between humor stories that don't contradict previous stories and good characterization you enrich them with your own voice Wow, thank you. Boom. <laughs> the, the, the not contradicting previous issues is a hard one um, because I think emotionally sometimes you have to contradict the previous issues mm -hmm. a little bit because these characters can't learn all their lessons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that, that's, 
that's one of the hardest parts about doing a Marvel book. Yeah, I think is, you know, I, I said this recently. It's like, the, it's the fine line, right? The fine line between I need to contradict this, but I don't want to do it because, you know, is this respectful to the guy to the guys who created it, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, I was saying this recently to somebody that, uh, um, when you look at like a title like Amazing Spider-Man and you look at all the supporting cast, they've all gone through hell. Every single one of them has, you know, been murdered, come back, had their spouses murdered. That's what I was going to say. Died and come back, most of them. <laughs> become super villains, superheroes. Like any one of these instances would be enough to alter a person's life completely and drive them crazy. Yeah. Um, but you have to pretend that's not the case or else you no longer have a supporting cast. If they're all just like shells of people in their apartments just shaking, like you don't have a book anymore. But you but you need, you know, you need Jameson to kind of be rough and tumble Jameson, you know, you need Peter Parker to, you know, sometimes mess up and like lose his temper a bit, like um like these are just things that kind of need to happen to keep the characters intact. Mm -hmm. And it, it's hard. It's tricky because it's not realistic. Yeah, absolutely. But nothing about it is realistic when you think about all the things that have happened. So absolutely. it's hard. Uh, let me see. Pedro Mercader, I loved your issue on Howard the Duck. How do you, how do you remember that gig? It's the best. This is, to this day, it's probably my favorite Marvel gig. And I'm super proud of uh, all those issues. The, uh, you know, with uh, Kevin McGuire, which is like a dream. Um, uh, the editor, Will Moss, was like, super supportive. And we ended up doing like, I'll say like 17 issues, something like that with, you know, the various reboots. Um, and I love them. It, we, we told a complete story and we were able to walk away knowing that we told that full story. And I think that's really rare in comics, mm -hmm. uh, especially with a title like Howard the Duck. Um, yes. To, to be able to you know last that long and walk away without actually being canceled, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'm hoping one day there's a nice uh, omnibus of it all because the uh, the trades the numbering is a little weird because like Secret Wars or whatever like there's a volume zero and then yeah. one two three yeah. like that's hard. Yeah, that that happened to me with the Spider One too because of the reboots and relaunches. I was like, yeah. oh, wait, which is actually the first one? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Javier Merino, have you ever thought about doing a horror comic or science fiction? Um, horror, I mean, Stillwater for Skybound is kind of horror. I mean, it's definitely the most horror thing I've done. Like, I, I did a book for Comicsology called Afterlift, which involved demons and hell, but um, it's more of a spiritual book than a horror book, really. Uh, so, yeah, so yeah, Stillwater is the closest to a horror book. There's some horrific things that happened in it. So, you should definitely check that out. Mm -hmm. Um, sci-fi that's a hard one I think I think proper sci-fi is really really tricky to do Mo most most of the times it turns into s fantasy instead of yeah. sci-fi right yeah because I, I did a book for image called Captara which was like space exploration but it was fantasy like it was like there's like a world of he-man kind of style stuff happening um, Star Wars is fantasy. It's not sci-fi. Yeah, that's that's so. what I always say about. Uh, did you see? Did you watch uh, James Cameron's history of history of science fiction, the documentary? No. There's a moment when he's talking to George Lucas, which is amazing, and he's telling George Lucas, "Well, as you are one of the masters of science fiction, like you did with Star Wars," and Lucas suddenly is like, "Stop! Star Wars is not science fiction. It never was. It's fantasy." No. And, yeah. and Cameron is like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cut. <laughs> so yeah, yeah that's, that's what I always ask when people ask about um, that, about science fiction. I always say, what do you mean with science fiction? You mean hard sci-fi, C. Clark, Asimov, Heinlein, et cetera, et cetera, or you mean fantasy? Yeah. Sci because for you as a writer, it's like different universes, right? You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you talk about fantasy sci-fi, space opera, whatever you're gonna call it. It's like, I have no limits. It's all fantasy, yeah. but with the other one, you have really serious constraints. It's gotta be at least, as as Kip Thorne said with Interstellar, if it's not proven science, proven physics, it's gotta be plausible based on the laws of physics we have today. Yeah, it's an extrapolation of of science of today. 
Um, so yeah, so I, I don't think I'm smart enough to do that, <laughs> frankly. Uh, so I, I, I tend to shy away. Million, and you don't have the million bucks Christopher Nolan had to hire Kip Thorne, a Nobel Award winning, well, exactly. not yet, and, and tell him, yeah. hey, you know what? Just check all my script from yeah, beginning yeah. to end and tell me what to change based on yeah, the law. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, Vinicius Binar Rocha. Hey, Chip, love your work. Do you have any tip for someone who's trying to write comics for the first time? You there? Hello? Can you hear me, Chip? Hmm. Guys, I think we lost him. He's frozen. You there? Hello. 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 You, like, yeah. Do you see me now? Okay. You go through the screen froze for like 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, let's go back. Vinicius Binar Rocha. Hey, Chip. Love your work. Do you have any tip for someone who's trying to write comics for the first time? Um, I mean, the big tip would be uh, study comics like figure out how many panels per page works um, the, the, the amount of words that you can actually get into a panel. Like there, there, it's a lot of technical stuff. Um, uh, there are a lot of scripts that are just kind of available online from comic writers. You can study those. Uh, you don't really have those kind of constraints with like, if you're writing a novel, uh, so that's that's the big one. Finding an artist is actually the hardest part. Um, I often tell writers, you know, my number one bit of advice is to learn to draw. Yeah. And the other part is write, 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 write. At any time you have, at any moment you have, keep writing. As I tell to artists, yeah. keep drawing, keep drawing. If you don't do it, you don't learn how to get to the end. As we said before, editors love people who finish things. Yeah. Not yeah, that's, finish things. that's huge. Like, and, and don't write spider-man or daredevil or whatever for your scripts like because that's useless like yes. you can't show anyone that you can't get someone to draw it like don't do that exactly. it doesn't actually show what you can do as a writer mm -hmm. um but yeah like you know i had a friend years ago who couldn't find an artist so he taught himself to draw and then he, he finished a book you know and it looked okay uh, but it looked well enough that like he could show publishers who are just like, oh, this is a really well-written story. The drawings aren't that good. We're gonna hire you and put you with another artist. Like like he, he did the work and he showed that he does the work. Absolutely, absolutely. And had a, a final product to, to show the editors featuring original characters. Exactly, and there's some, there's in this day and age, guys, there's so many venues for you to show your work to editors. Mm -hmm. Use them, use them. Yeah. You know, that's why you have to work. Work a lot, finish things, show them to editors there's many ways they can see it and you can show them so yeah. even when i started 22 years ago there was fucking faxes and i lived in spain yeah yeah <laughs> okay and fedex didn't took two days to tend to send original art from spain to the us no yeah. it was a different universe so consider yourself lucky so use the chances you have in your favor now mm -hmm. the, the tools i'm sorry uh shabby Trust talk is Tegman, Chip. I love when you do that. Um, I get paid good money to trash talk Stegman, and if there's no money, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Okay. You uh, know, you, you do. You know, I do what I love, and I love to trash talk Stegman, but, uh, uh, but you know, at some point, you gotta you gotta make money doing it, right? <laughs> okay. Jack Howell says, Chip Sadarsky. Is my foster dad. That's what he says. I don't know if they're friends of you or not because they have a the dialogue here. Shabby says, Oh, why do oh dude, white trees was so good? Uh, Jack Howell answers, I can't believe there's only 25 of us. Fair. Ah, uh, yeah, 28 now. Uh, <laughs> but don't don't believe that because the number here, then you go and see the numbers on Facebook and Twitter oh, and YouTube. That's Jack's crazy. Uh, then, uh, Dan T. Carla. Hello, Mr. Sedarsky. I really love the way you write. See, uh, now I have the, the Russian accent for the whole question. <laughs> I really love the way you write. 
Uh, when can we read you in Avengers team in the way Giffen and the Matis do, uh, did with GL GLI? Ooh, that's I a good think idea. That would be a great comic. Wait, what do I sign? Where do we have to sign? Yeah, I know. It's you know what? It's really hard to do a book like that now. I think. I think the market is so um, restrictive that uh, I, I don't think people say they want funny books, but uh, I don't think they come out uh, in numbers yeah. to actually prove that. The, the best book of the year was Jimmy Olsen. I agree. Like okay. it's, it's, it's so well done, so well told, so funny. Absolutely. And, uh, and you know, they 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 manage a, a really nice run, mm -hmm. but it should have been in the top three. I agree, absolutely agree. You know, and, uh, and, and I think that in a different distribution system in a different market, it would yeah. be, it would yeah. be. But you know, the readers we have are the readers we have, and they want what they want. Yeah, and and the trend is obviously towards kind of darker, serious, yeah. mature adult. Um, which you know, I mean, I enjoy those stories as well, but. Uh, but uh, it definitely feels a little restrictive uh, in terms of marketplace right now. And it's not that Marvel hasn't tried lately. They did the uh, Great Lake Avengers not that long ago, and then yeah. West Co Kelly Kelly did uh, West Coast West Avengers, Coast. who was also yeah. in that tone, and he didn't sell. So yeah, and even like the team from the Justice League did the Defenders miniseries, you know, yep. a few Same. years ago as well. It's 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 hard out there for a humor book. Absolutely. Uh, Jack Howell says, "Hey, ship, I was you for Halloween." And I was the only one at the school in costume. Do you have any school? Do you have any tips for high school artists trying to get into the industry? Well, we just said it, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. If he if he wants to draw, draw. You know, <laughs> uh, you know there there are a lot of art books out there. Um, you know, I, even to this day, like you know, I, I tend to recommend even to artists who are currently working for Marvel uh, how to draw comics the Marvel way if they want to, yeah. you know, uh, get better at storytelling. Um, yeah, uh, I don't recommend dressing as me for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, no one knows who I am, so that's yeah. I I always recommend that one, and also you know the George Bridgman book, the about anatomy. anatomy. Oh, I don't think I know that one. I've, I've got a few anatomy books at home that I still reference. Like, that's the other thing. You never, never stop amazing. learning. Which one is amazing? I discovered because of uh, Brian Cunningham, the DC editor years ago. Yeah, yeah. How he moves the figure, the human figure. I will send you a link later. They are really, really good. Uh, yeah, Hawthorne. even like Mike Hawthorne, the artist oh, yeah. who just helped us out on Daredevil, like, he's got an amazing uh, life drawing anatomy book um, for sale through his website. So I, I definitely yeah, recommend I, that. I don't have that. Like, one. even. Even like three or four years ago, um, I took a course in Toronto with Ty Templeton, the oh, artist. Oh, oh my god! Uh, on anatomy, because my anatomy is not that good, and so you know I've been drawing comics professionally for years. And I sat in the class with like all these new artists, and like I, every week Ty would teach me more, and you know hopefully I became a bit better. Uh, yeah, you never stop learning. And Ty is an amazing artist. For you, those people who don't know him, or don't remember him, you should yeah. go, yeah. go back and check all, all his uh, DC stuff and all this his stuff because he's really, really that good. Yeah. Look, somebody comes to say hello, Jorge Fornes. Your your artist, Jorge Fornes. Oh hey. Um, what what a handsome guest you have today. Big hugs to you, Chip. Aw, he's the best. I can't believe he's slumming it at DC with Rorschach. Yeah, yeah. Big what high a shame! Trish, high tuition. We know where you live, Jorge, or at least I do, and I can tell shit. So yeah, I would, I would, I would. Oh, I love his work so much. If he came back to Daredevil, I would die a happy man. Come back. You come back. I miss I you. Talk, miss you. I'm sorry, uh, Felipe Gonzalez Hernandez. Do you have more plans for Spider-Man? I love your run and how you have written Peter Parker and Teresa. Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the nice things about the fact that like people seem to like my spectacular run and Spider-Man Life Story did well. Um, Marvel and I are always kind of talking about potential Spider-Man things. So, um, yeah, yeah, there might be some stuff coming up. Yeah, and that's, that's all he can say. Don't, don't he yeah. say it. He won't, it's an exclusive. You won't take a word. You can take a word off his mouth, so don't say it. 
Yeah. Uh, Ramsey Hassan, high ship boring technical writing question. Mm -hmm. How many days does it take you to write a draft of a 22 page comic? Well, in today's there are 20, but 20. Yeah. how many drafts does a work for higher script go through before it's sent, it's sent to the artist? Um, it, it all depends. Like, if I have like the full arc kind of figured out. Like I, you know, I've got a master document of everything I want to have happen. Mm -hmm. um, it usually takes me about three days uh, to write a script, the first draft. And it depends on the editor. It depends on uh, what they need for me for revisions. Uh, some editors I get very few revisions. Sometimes, like I send them the script, it just goes right to the artist. Mm -hmm. Some it comes back, and they've got notes, and we have to discuss, and I, I figure it out. Sometimes. If they want to get the artist going, they'll send them the pages that are ready. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have to go back and edit the other ones. But the thing with the process is there are a lot of stages to it. So when after I write that script, after I edit it, and it goes to the artist, then the layouts come in. So I give notes in the layouts. Pencils, notes on pencils, sometimes notes on inks, colors. And then when that's all in, then I rewrite the script um, with the dialogue properly. Mm -hmm. to, to match the art, goes to lettering, more notes on the lettering. Like there's a lot of stages of rewriting and notes. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so, but the initial draft is usually three to four days, I'd say. Okay. Curtis Thornton, I loved the breakdown of a panel in the back of white trees. Mm -hmm. It made me realize I miss a lot of things when reading. Yeah. just to see how things progress and how they're made. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, the White Trees one is especially, because, yeah, Chris is so good at delivering like subtle emotions and um, things that you may miss on your first read through and you can go back and, and catch again. Yeah. Felipe Gonzalez Hernandez says, I am a big fan of Fantastic Four. Your run on Marvel 2 in 1 was superb at the same level that the short run of uh, Dwayne McDuffie did at FF, A Blaze of Glory. Do you have more plans for F for the FF? Um, I don't. The um, I was super happy to do the Fantastic Four X-Men miniseries. Um, that was like my first chance to really write all those characters together. Um, but yeah, no, no plans. Like, you know, I've talked to the, the that editor a few times about doing more FF stuff, but um, but like Dan's doing such a great job on the main title. Um, I kind of just want to step back and, and read it instead mm -hmm. of, you know, doing a ancillary book or anything like that. Like yeah. I enjoy it as a reader. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things you kind of miss when you become a creator is being surprised by stories. Mm -hmm. Like I get so many stories spoiled for me at Marvel now that, you know, I try to just like, I try to just read the books without, talking to people about it. <laughs> Robotman, are you leaning to become more a writer than a penciler? Right now, yeah. I mean, um, I can do more as a writer. You know, I can write many books as a writer and as an artist, I could only focus on one at a time. Uh, I've given myself, like I mentioned earlier, like maybe six months of not drawing while I'm traveling out west and uh, and I've got a few ideas right now for books, so I might, I might end up writing and drawing a thing for mm -hmm. myself, which would be fun. Remember, guys, for the sake of his marriage. For the sake of my marriage. For the time being. That's more yeah. important than comics, believe me. Uh, yeah. Kagan Ray, you and Matt hired many talented artists to draw uh, winners on the, th on the XXX covers. If you yeah. were to choose an artist to draw your winner, who would it be? Someone to draw my junk. <laughs> Oof. I mean, it's got to be Chris Anka. He's so good. I Yeah, I think at one point he wanted me to send him a picture of my abs, which I don't have. I forget what the reason was. <laughs> We're going to do something in Star-Lord where he was going to draw abs on my stomach or something. So I feel like if I sent him a, a picture of my penis, it'd be fine to draw it. We'll see. Maybe we'll do a White Trees Kickstarter and that'll be our final stretch goal. <laughs> Amanda Sembler, how do you get over 
doing so many rewrites? And what do you think are some ways to get better at drawing and drawing? Um, working at a newspaper for 12 years uh, really helped me in terms of like edits and rewrites. Uh, I remember the first thing I wrote for the paper, like it was a big joke thing. I had a full page of graphics and jokes and the editor came back to me. He's like, what are you doing? Like, this is like a thousand word joke. Like you have to cut it down to 300 words. Like it's a newspaper. People need to read and keep moving. And I was like, no, my words are so precious. <laughs> but then I went back and I trimmed it down and I realized, oh my God, he's right. He's so right. And so, um, uh, that job taught me to not be precious with my words because we constantly had to cut them for space. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes we'd send an edition of the paper out nationally um, at a certain word length. And then an hour later, we'd send it for a local market, Toronto, mm -hmm. and it would have to be cut in half because there's an ad on the page. So I'd have to edit it really quickly. So I, I, I have no problem with edits, um, especially if they help the story. Mm -hmm. like, um, there, are, there are editors at Marvel who just have a really great story sense. So um, uh, it becomes like a fun game back and forth to make the story better. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, the best kind of editors are ones who are just like, here's my suggestions on how to make it better. Take it or leave it. Go for yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Just let you think about it and, and decide if that's the story you want to tell. You know who was amazing from the get-go as an editor, assistant editor? Will Moss at DC. Because he, came, he also came from newspapers. Yeah, to see it, you know how yeah. fast he reacted to everything, and yeah, he was my first editor. Oops, freezing again. Okay, oh. you're you're back. You you just throw for five seconds now. Um, all right, basically, Will Moss is amazing. Yes, we agree. We all agree. And if you don't agree with that, we know what you live to. So, get oh, yeah. uh, Flash is also my favorite character. Uh, Marowak Oscuro, Dark Marowak. Hi, Chip. Loved the Spider Man life story. If you were to write another life story, which character would you use? Is there any chance another comic life story gets released? Like he's going to tell you again. <laughs> well, you know, what I, what I can say is like when I finished Spider Man life story, um, Marvel talked to me about doing more of them. Um, but uh, I think the first suggestion was Fantastic Four. But the problem with the format is it's so dense. Like doing a decade for Spider-Man in like 30 pages or whatever, uh, like it was, it was incredibly hard to do it and have it make narrative sense. So the idea of doing Fantastic Four in the same format when you have four characters it would be a disservice to the characters and at least the way I would write it. Like somebody smarter than me might be able to figure it out. Um, and, and yeah, you don't want to go, you don't want to go back to the well too many times. Um, if I was to do a character like Captain America would probably make the most sense mm -hmm. just because of like dealing with time and the character out of time. Yeah. Um, and you have a, a more of a focus, mm -hmm. but um, there, there is, how much can I say? While I'm not, while I'm not going to do a, another full life story series, there is something in the works that kind of scratches that itch a little bit. Okay. So, yeah, hopefully that gets announced soon. Okay, but it's, it's also when you're thinking about the Fantastic Four, I always remind people: Do you do you remember how many things Stan and Jack created per issue? Yeah. But every month was more and more. So you have to translate that into years. I know. In 30 pages, like, how can you do that? No, it would be, it'd be really hard. Spider-Man Spider Life Story was the hardest Marvel book I've ever had to do because of how much research and preparation yeah. we had to do for it. Um, it just took up so much time. That's the other consideration, just how long it takes to work on that book. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're blessed with Mark Bagley because he's the fastest best penciler in spider-man history yeah so uh so we were able to actually do the book um have it look great and come out on time that's that's hard to do with the yeah. 30 page Absolutely. issues and it's also the part that people doesn't think about as as chip just said is the time it takes you to get to the page the yeah. research the study you know that 
and then you get to the page but in this kind of projects it takes a long time to prepare yeah until yeah. you feel you're ready right yeah exactly eric lund seems earlier in your career you were perceived as the comedy guy in comics but you have obviously proved you can do a lots of different style was it uh, hard to break that perception i'm loving a still water um I'm not I'm not concerned about perception, so it wasn't wasn't really a problem. Like I, I went from Howard the Duck, and they offered me some books I turned down, but then they offered me Star Lord, and what the situation was like he was going to be on Earth, stranded there on his own, and I was like, oh, there's there's a chance there to tell a story about kind of like Peter Quill's sadness, uh, trying to reintegrate into this world, and so it was it's the tone is always story and character driven. Like mm -hmm. I could have made it a straight comedy book, I guess, mm -hmm. because of Howard the Duck, but I don't know. I, I often say that like, you know, it's probably a detriment to my career that I like to try different genres and tones because then uh, I don't really build uh, like a, a particular fan base. You know, we talked about Stephen King earlier, like Stephen yep. King wrote exclusively horror for a very long time. Uh, until you know the Richard Bachman stuff, but uh, and when he uh, did, it, he used a uh, he used a uh, as, as, as um, a pen name. So yeah, exactly. Um, you know, Daniel Steele writes you know romance. Tom Clancy writes you know Clancy style thrillers, yeah. um, and that's that's a smart way to go because you know what you're getting when you pick up one of those books. Mm -hmm. um, you you don't really know. What I could do Stillwater or Daredevil, um, so uh, I, I don't. I probably should be more concerned about perception, but I'm not. Like I think, like everyone, like I like different things. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. when, as a consumer, very rare do you have a consumer who's just like I only watch horror movies, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> hopefully. So, <laughs> yeah, so so why wouldn't the creators also feel that way? Like. You know, as a creator, it's, like it's limiting. Why do you want to limit the, the, your chances at writing, or you know, the types of stories you can you can tell, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and but I get why because it makes sense marketing wise. Like, I am a sci-fi writer, and I write sci-fi. Yeah, you know, um, I do legal thrillers. That's what I do. Like, um, it makes sense in, in building a career, but I don't think creatively uh, that sounds very satisfying to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Kagan Ray. Uh, what number ones did you look at when writing a Stillwater? Does it does it stand up to those books? Hmm. Um, I didn't specifically look at different number ones. You know, I've written a, f a bunch of them at this point. Um, so you really want to like introduce your main character. Obviously, introduce the scenario that they're in. Um, hopefully, the uh, twists at the end to get people coming back for more. Uh, uh, yeah, I didn't study necessarily any number ones to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's always the concern that you haven't given them enough in issue one to have them come back for more. I, I feel like we did the job and hopefully the end of issue two has a similar feel where you want to kind of keep coming back. You know, we're not all Brian K. Vaughn, who's the master of the cliffhanger, mm -hmm. um, the splash page cliffhanger. But, uh, um, that seems like a thing an issue one really needs. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I gotta say, I loved it. So, oh, cool. Thanks. Uh, let me see. Kate Robinson, writing wise, <coughs> sorry, are there any bits of information on the craft you were given after which everything changed? Like, between brackets, always give a character this or never start a story with this, that sort of thing. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I'm super lucky in the sense that, um, I did sex criminals with Matt, so I got to read his scripts. So I, I, I learned a lot about writing from from that and from conversations with him. And one of the things he taught me was uh, uh, every, and I, th I think it's a thing he picked up from like a, a movie script book, but um, every character introduced needs to want something. Mm -hmm. Like no matter how minor or major, you know, like if it's two people in a, in a, a diner, having a conversation, each of those characters needs to want something that, that drives them. 
mm-hmm. even the, the the waiter or waitress has to want something. What they what they want is these guys to finish their coffee and get out so she can have some peace and quiet. Like mm-hmm. those kind of things add uh, dimensions to characters, and uh, oftentimes you just focus on like the main character, uh, but not on the ancillary characters. And um, each one is important to the story, and if they're not, then they shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that you don't want your uh, ancillary secondary characters to be like you know wooden dolls, right? Just standing yeah. there, and people re- and people noticing that they they are there just to cover space. Yeah, yeah, and like um, I, I've noticed, like working with different editors, each editor has their own little ticks, things that like, oh, something has to happen to, you know, Captain America has to do this once an issue, mm-hmm. you know, so, something like that. Where you're just like, oh, okay. Sometimes I agree, sometimes I don't agree, but uh, you, you kind of have to take each one of those and determine whether or not it's worth a fight or whether you just have Captain America say, I'm Captain America every issue. <laughs> I don't know. what I don't. It's a random example that's yes. not a real one. Yeah. Uh, let me see. How hard do you... Uh, Carlos Ramos, sorry about forgetting the name. Carlos Ramos asks, how hard do you need to lean on the Catholic guilt uh, for Daily? Um it's obviously a huge part of the character. Um, I, I love the fact that he is Catholic and we can actually kind of play with that. Uh, um, cause it, it works so well with just the standard superhero guilt. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's less about the Catholic guilt. It's more about the, his faith. Like I'm fascinated by, uh, men of faith and, uh, what drives them to think that what's, So my run is going to play and he's going forward as, as mm-hmm. Matt has to make a lot of decisions. Okay. Kagan Ray, if you could write and draw anything in Star Wars, what would it be? Whew. Man, that's a hard one. Maybe like a young teen Jabba. Cool Jabba out in the town. Pod racing. When he when you mean when he still was going to the gym? Yeah, exactly. Played, right. <laughs> yeah, like a hunk, like a real hunk. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Mark Cabnet. How are the duck? Are, are puns now optional as Marvel is now owned by Disney? I need to know ship and then in, in big capital letters. I need to know. You know what? Unless um, unless Marvel dug in and pulled out all the documents and renegotiated and figured it all out, uh, the pants stay on. Mm -hmm. Like, is it, is it worth it to have the pants off that they have to have their lawyers, you know, get paid hundreds, thousands of dollars an hour to sort it out? Probably not. So (laughs) I say just keep the pants on them. Okay. Carlos Ramos adds Java the hunk. Yes. Java the hunk. This, that's yep. the that's gotta be the name of the miniseries, of course. There yeah. you go. Uh, Ma- Oscuro, if you have to pick an issue <clears throat> for or for, of a comic, I guess, for someone to read this year, which could you choose? Oh, that's so hard. I mean, it's hard for a lot of reasons. Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there to read. Um, also, most of them are written by friends, so I feel if I pick one, <laughs> then well, my other friends will get mad. Jimmy Olsen is the best book of the year, so we can... I mean, yeah, that, yeah, but I think that's indisputable. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, now Jimmy Olsen came out in um, uh, soft cover last week, mm-hmm. and uh, and I, I highly recommend it. There is some stuff in there that just had me rolling with laughter, and I contributed one joke to it Oh, secretly. And I want people to try and figure out what it is. No, don't reveal it. Don't reveal it. It's a background, it's a background gag. Okay. Oh. There's a director's cut could come later, you know, in a, some yeah, high yeah. or something, and then we'll reveal the joke. Okay? Yeah, perfect. So one last one before I let you go, because we are like uh, seven minutes away from two hours. Okay. You have a life. Well, yeah. Mark Abnett says, what's your process for plotting an issue? Do you break it down page by page, scene by scene, or just start writing? Um, I take the arc, like I, kn- I kind of know what the, an arc looks like. And what I usually do is um, 
I write out the whole arc in plot points, and then I color code it for the various characters. And then I kind of shift those around to make sure um, we don't lose sight of any characters. Uh, once I have that, um, then I can break it down by issue. Once I have it broken down by issue, um, I break it down by page, just like the main things that happened on each page. That becomes another document, and then I start writing the script based on that. And if if I need to adjust things, I adjust things at that point. Mm -hmm. The moment I say we're leaving in five minutes, that's when everybody starts asking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got them scared. El Tuna Nocturno. What's the worst thing that Matt Fraction has asked you to draw? And what's the worst thing you've asked another artist to draw? Oh, man. You can't, you, guys, Matt has asked him to draw a lot of really. No, I'm sorry. I'm kidding. <laughs> Just... It's one of those things where um, in one of the early issues, there was like a, an adult porn store um, uh, that I had to draw, and I, I put my everything into it. Like I drew every gag, every small detail, every item. Um, and it, you know, took it all out of me. Every pun I could do for a porn title, I threw in there. <laughs> and the, pro the, pro the problem is, Matt was like, oh, that worked really well. And so like a few issues later, he's like, oh, we're in like a different kind of porn store. I'm just like, no, no, I <laughs> can't do this anymore. Um, yeah, he made one. He's like, oh, it's like an Apple store but, but for porn. I'm like, well, at least that's s simpler. Um, well, that's so the Apple stores are just white on crystal and four tables so <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so i could limit it a bit so yeah every once in a while he would ask for like a thing that's too much he also liked to do the family circus style panels mm -hmm. which are like the overhead with like the dotted line of the character going through yeah and uh, um, and so you have to design the resort which is really hard like trying to figure out how they're going to look because you're going to be using it later on in the issue and uh, like how far out can you go? Like designing stuff is, is a, can take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he's, he, at least he understands when um, he needs to pull back. I think there's one scene where a character is about to walk into like a giant mall full of like porn stuff and he cuts to black and basically says, I won't make chip draw this. I'm like, that's great. <laughs> and the other like, second part of the question, and what's the worst thing you've made another artist do? Oh, I feel guilty all the time, all the time. Any any time there's like a big scene of a lot of characters, uh, or cars or buildings, like, um, yeah, all all the time. I feel bad all the time. Oh, you're an artist. It makes just sense that you feel guilty, you know, to make an artist. You know, you know, it, the time and effort it takes. So yeah, in in Spider-Man Life Story. Um, you know, I, I would always feel bad making Mark draw like tons of characters and things happening. And so in the final issue, I made sure that the final kind of battle was inside a character's mind and the background was white. And in the script, I'm like, this is my gift to you, Mark, for putting up with me for six issues. You just get to draw Spider-Man characters fighting each other against white. <laughs> like... Like, and, don't, he don't, email, and he then email you back saying, change it, this is boring. I need to draw more. <laughs> if anyone's going to do it, it would probably be Mark. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cassandra Higgins, what's, what's your favorite thing to draw in Sex Criminals? I, I, the, 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 honestly, just the main characters. Like, um, partly because they're based on friends of mine. So every time I draw them, I'd be looking at photos of friends of mine or thinking about my friends and like... Uh, uh, they became easier to draw as time went on, so I, I really, I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And the, you know what, like the hard things to draw were also like my favorite things. Like drawing that porn store was was one of my favorite things. It took forever, but it, you know, I'm I'm super happy with how it turned out. Because of the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. In a way, yeah. so I'm gonna I'm gonna draw this. I'm gonna do it. Yeah, there there are a lot of things like there was like a breakup scene in sex criminals. That was really great to draw just because they were silent. So, uh, um, he, he had more control over the page. Um, yeah. Like the whole series was like incredibly hard to do and also a delight to draw. Okay. So the last one for me, this one for me, is there anything that's been nagging you 
you wanted to draw or uh, you know or or write for many many years that you haven't had the chance and you keep telling yourself before i retire or die or any of or both or both i'm going to fucking do this no um i'm super happy with the stuff i've been able to do and uh it's like i said earlier i take things on a case-by-case -case basis uh uh Honestly, the, only, the the one thing that I kind of really wanted to do was to draw some Batman, and I got to do that this summer, which is fun. Um, you know, I have two or three kind of like ideas of my own that I want to draw uh, that may not be commercially viable that you know I keep kind of putting off, and at some point, probably when I retire, I'll I'll just do it. Um, one a book about newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of about my time at newspapers and what newspapers are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe one day. Okay, so to leave some really nice comments to you. Thank you for answering. I know I've been here, I arrived here in the last minute. Uh, Chips for Fantastic Four reminded me a lot of Walter Simonson. Oh, wow. And I think that's the best compliment I can give to any creator in that series. That is the highest compliment. I think Walt Simonson's Fantastic Four run is like the top Marvel run. Like it's just so much fun. I yeah. love that series so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have the time and you can check the, the one of this I did with Arthur, Arthur Adams when mm, he explained yeah. how they, they created the you know, the, the other Fantastic the Four. The new Fantastic Four, yeah. Thinking nobody was going to buy it. Uh, nobody was going to like it. And that was crazy. And how <laughs> everybody reacted. They were like, wait, what? People is liking this? <laughs> so so yeah. bonkers. It was absolutely bonkers. Okay. So uh, Jack Howell is asking you to sing happy birthday to him because his birthday is November 16th. This is unexpected. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, what I will say to Jack is, uh, I am a um, forty-four-year-old man, and uh, perhaps your attention should be focused elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, and you and you are seventeenth, so. Oh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Up with you. Too late. I mean, have, happy birthday to him. Yes, happy on birthday, birthday, Jack, on uh, November. It's November second, man, and you're asking to have to wish from now. I know you young people think time moves really fast. But it's still five, 14 fucking days to your birthday. So That's a good point. That's a good point. Come down. Come down. You have time. Anyway, we're leaving now. All right. Please keep don't cut because I want to say proper thank you to you after we're off the, off the live feed. All right. But to all of you, thank you so much for being here. Have a nice day. All right. Thanks, all. Wear your fucking mask. Wear your fucking mask. Thank you, Chief, for being here. Pleasure. And to all of you, we'll be back tomorrow. Spanish, remember, there's one is in Spanish with Sagar Fornies, con Sagar Fornies y Jordi Pastor, two Spanish amazing creators. Uh, and on Friday, we have some Phillips. And continue. So take care, stay safe, use the mask, don't be assholes. Bye bye. We're out right. in three, two, 